first postcard came from Forfa. I thought you might like a picture of Forfa, it said. You have always been so interested in Scotland, and that is one reason why I am interested in you. I have enjoyed all your books, but do you really get to grips with people? I doubt it. Try to think of this as a handshake from your devoted admirer, W.S. Like other novelists, Walter Streeter was used to getting communications from strangers, but answering them took up the time and energy he needed for his writing, so that he was rather relieved that W.S. had given no address. The photograph of Forfer was uninteresting and he tore it up. His anonymous correspondent's criticism, however, lingered in his mind. Did he really fail to come to grips with his characters? Perhaps he did. About ten days later arrived another postcard, this time from Berwick-on-Tweed. "'What do you think of Berwick-on-Tweed?' it said. "'Like you, it's on the border. I hope this doesn't sound rude. I don't mean that you are a borderline case. You know how much I admire your stories. Some people call them otherworldly. I think you should plump for one world or the other. Another firm handshake from W.S. "'Otherworldly, indeed!' He reread the last two chapters he had written. Perhaps they didn't have their feet firm on the ground. And as the days passed, he became uncomfortably aware of self-division, as though someone had taken hold of his personality and was pulling it apart. His work was no longer homogenous. There were two strains in it, unreconciled and opposing, and it went much slower as he tried to resolve the discord. If only I could correlate the two and make their conflict fruitful, as many artists have. But how could W.S. have known that? And who was W.S., anyhow? For the first time it struck him that the initials were his own. No, not for the first time. He had noticed it before. They were such commonplace initials. They were Gilberts, they were Morms, they were Shakespeare's. A common possession. Anyone might have them. Yet now it seemed to him an odd coincidence. And the idea came into his mind. Suppose I had been writing postcards to myself. The people did such things, especially people with split personalities. Not that he was one, of course. He looked at the handwriting again. It had seemed the perfection of ordinariness, anybody's hand, so ordinary as perhaps to be disguised. Now, he fancied, he saw in it resemblances to his own. His being was strung up in expectation of the next postcard. Yet when it came, it took him, as the others had, completely by surprise. He could not bring himself to look at the picture. I hope you are well, and would like a postcard from Coventry, he read. Have you ever been sent to Coventry? I have. In fact, you sent me there. I am getting nearer. Perhaps we shall come to grips after all. I advised you to come to grips with your characters, didn't I? Another hard handshake, as always, W.S. A wave of panic surged up in Water Streeter. How was it that he had never noticed all this time the most significant fact about the postcards, that each one came from a place geographically closer to him than the last? I am coming nearer. He took an atlas and idly traced out W.S.'s itinerary. An interval of eighty miles or so seemed to separate the stopping places. Walter lived in a large west country town about ninety miles from Coventry. He had no enemies. He was not a man of strong personal feelings. Such feelings as he had went into his books. In his books he had drawn some pretty nasty characters. Not of recent years, however. Of recent years he had felt a reluctance to draw a very bad man or woman. He thought it morally irresponsible, and artistically unconvincing, too. There was good in everyone. But in the past he had let himself go once or twice, he did not remember his old books very well, but there was a character in one, the outcast, into whom he had really got his knife, as if he was a real person whom he was trying to show up. He had never felt a twinge of pity for him, even when he paid the penalty for his misdeeds on the gallows. Odd that he couldn't remember the man's name. He took the book down from the shelf and turned the pages. Even now they affected him uncomfortably. Yes, here it was. William. William. William Stainsforth, his own initials. So uneasy was he that when the next postcard came, it came as a relief. I am quite close now, he read, and involuntarily he turned the postcard over. The glorious central tower of Gloucester Cathedral met his eye. Then, with an effort, he went on reading. 
All being well, I look forward to seeing you some time this weekend. Then we can really come to grips. As always, W.S. P.S. Does Gloucester remind you of anything? Gloucester Jail? Walter took the postcard straight to the police station, told them of the others, and asked if he could have police protection over the weekend. The officer in charge smiled at him and said he was quite sure it was a hoax, but he would tell someone to keep an eye on the premises. You've uh, no idea who it could be, he asked. Walter shook his head. It was Tuesday. He set himself to work as though he could work, and presently he found he could, differently from before, and, he thought, better. So passed the days, and the dawn of Friday seemed like any other day, until something jerked him out of his self-induced trance, and suddenly he asked himself, When does a weekend begin? A long weekend begins on Friday. At that, his panic returned. He went to the street door and looked out. The car went slowly down the street. Some people crossed it. Everything was normal. And when Saturday came, bringing no postcard, his panic had almost subsided. He nearly rang up the police station to tell them not to bother to send anyone after all. They were as good as their word. They did send someone. Between tea and dinner, the time when weekend guests most commonly arrive, Walter went to the door, and there, between two unlit gateposts, he saw a policeman standing, the first policeman he'd ever seen in Charlotte Street. At the sight, and at the relief it brought him, he realised how anxious he had been. Now he felt safer than he'd ever felt in his life, and also a little ashamed at having given extra trouble to a hard-worked body of men. "'Come in, come in, my dear fellow!' he exclaimed. He held out his hand, but the policeman did not take it. "'You must have been very cold standing out there. "'I didn't know that it was snowing, though,' he added, "'seeing the snowflakes on the policeman's cape and helmet. "'Come in and warm yourself.' "'Thanks,' said the policeman. "'I don't mind if I do.' He looked around. "'So, this is where you work,' he said. "'Yes, I was writing when you rang. "'Some poor devils for it, I expect,' the policeman said. "'Oh?' Why? Walter was hurt by his unfriendly tone, and noticed how hard his gooseberry eyes were. I'll tell you in a minute, said the policeman. And then the telephone bell rang. Walter excused himself and hurried from the room. This is the police station, said a voice. Is that Mr. Streeter? Walter said it was. Well, Mr. Streeter, how is everything at your place? All right, I hope. I'll tell you why I ask. I'm sorry to say we quite forgot about that little job we were going to do for you. Bad coordination, I'm afraid. Would you like us to send somebody now? Yes, but, but yes, please. All right, then. We'll be with you in a jiffy. Walter put back the receiver. What now, he asked himself. A jiffy, they had said. What was a jiffy in terms of minutes? While he was debating, the door opened and his guest came in. No room's private when the street doors once passed, he said. Have you forgotten I was once a policeman? Was, said Walter, edging away from him. You are a policeman. I have been other things as well, the policeman said. Thief, pimp, blackmailer, not to mention murderer. You should know. The policeman, if such he was, seemed to be moving towards him, and Walter suddenly became alive to the importance of small distances, the distance from the sideboard to the table, the distance from one chair to another. I don't know what you mean, he said. Why do you speak like that? I've never done you any harm. I've never set eyes on you before. Oh, haven't you, the man said. But you've thought about me, and you've written about me. You got some fun out of me, didn't you? Now I'm going to get some fun out of you. You hadn't any pity for me, had you? Well, I'm not going to have any pity for you. But I, I tell you, cried Walter, cutting the tail edge, I, I, I don't know you. And now you say you don't know me. You did all that to me. And then forget me. You forgot William Stainsforth. William Stainsforth? Yes. I was your scapegoat, wasn't I? You unloaded all your self-dislike on me. Now, as one W.S. to another, what shall I do? If I behave in character, I... Uh, I don't know, muttered Walter. You don't know? You ought to know. You fathered me. What would William Stainsforth do? if he met his old dad in a quiet place, his kind old father, who made him swing. Walter would only stare at him. You never 
give me a chance, did you? Well, I'm going to give you one. That shows you never understood me, doesn't it, Dad? Walter said nothing. Well, if you can tell me of one virtue you ever credited me with, just one kind thought, just one redeeming feature. Yes, said Walter, trembling. Well, then, I'll let you off. And uh, if I can't, whispered Walter, well, then, that's just too bad. We'll have to come to grips, and you know what that means. Walter began to pant. I'll give you two minutes to remember. They both looked at the clock. At first, the stealthy movement of the hand paralysed Walter's thought. Desperately, he searched his memory for one fact that would save him. He thought, and suddenly his mind relaxed, and he saw printed on it like a photograph the last page of the book. Then, with the speed and magic of a dream, each page appeared before him in perfect clarity until the first was reached and he realised with overwhelming force that what he looked for was not there. In all that evil there was not one hint of good, and he felt compulsively and with a kind of exultation that unless he testified to this, the cause of goodness everywhere would be betrayed. There's nothing to be said for you, he shouted, and you know it. Of all your dirty tricks, this is the dirtiest. You want me to whitewash you, do you? The very snowflakes on you are turning black. How Dare you ask me for a character? I've given you one already. God forbid that I should ever say a good word for you. I'd rather die. Stainford's hand shot out. Then die, he said. The police found Walter Streeter slumped across the dining table. His body was still warm, but he was dead. It was easy to tell how he died, for it was not his hand that his visitor had shaken, but his throat. Walter Streeter had been strangled. Of his assailant, there was no trace. On the table and on his clothes were flakes of melting snow. But how it came there remained a mystery, for no snow was reported from any district on the day he died. Robert Lang was reading W.S. by L.P. Hartley. It was produced by Peter Kavanagh. And looking ahead, a man inherits some objects, but will he be able to control the events they set in motion? Find out when Robert Lang reads The Price of the Absolute, another story by L.P. Hartley at the same time tomorrow.